So, tonight we're going to move on to the speaker in a moment, but we've got a new innovation this evening because we've taken a decision that we think it'd be helpful that each of the members' meetings would give you just a quick 10-minute update on one of the many issues that we're trying to pursue on your behalf. So this evening, David is going to talk to you, and David is going to tell you about the work he and Could you please mute? Everybody's not muted, please mute. Okay, right. So David is going to talk to you about the work that he and others have been doing about trying to secure the electrification of the Lancaster to Morecambe railway line. So, David, over to you. You've got 10 minutes. If you don't finish within 10 minutes, I will cut you off. I'll be well before that. It's um, good evening, all. And it's just to update you. Uh, as you know, we started this uh, campaign off probably June of last year initially. Um, uh, we've re revisited it now, uh, the, the, the basic reason being... Uh, David Austin, can you turn your sound off, please? Uh, we've... For some reason, it won't mute him. Uh, well, anyway, well, we've revisited this um, to, to gain the momentum. We had the support of David Morris. Uh, MP. Uh, we've also got the support of uh, Cat Smith. Cat Smith has asked a question of the minister. Um, and uh, a couple of weeks ago, I've had meetings with uh, Lizzie Collin. Uh, with Lizzie Collin. Can I ask uh, again, can everybody please mute the microphones? Because we're getting feedback and nobody can hear what David's saying. So uh, we... It's David Austin who's the problem. And I... Um, I keep muting him, and he keeps on muting it. So I wonder if you'd leave your uh, your, your microphone off, please, David. Um, so anyway, we had a meeting with Lizzie Collins and Catherine Potter, and it was a, a lot of support from both of those. Lizzie is the county councillor. Uh, Catherine is um, the, the one with the portfolio on the city. Um, a very, very good meeting. Uh, Lizzie has... Uh, written to um, uh, Mike Cliff uh, and um, uh, Philippa Williamson at County saying that they support it and that they want to go that way. And we, and we have a lot of basically support of most of the councillors as well, cross party. So the support is very, very good. Um, the only thing that has come up a couple of times is people are talking about um, uh, using battery ones where we think the, the real answer should be the electrification and the reasons for it. Uh, the initial responses that came from County, from Mike Cliff, uh, were pretty dismissive. You know, we know about this and we're thinking about it and, you know, we'll let you know and don't call us, we'll call you. Um, however, since the responses have been going on to them uh, and the pressure has been put on them, uh, there's been some recent developments and the tone coming from county is quite different. Uh, we understand that Network Rail have been looking at Lancaster Station particularly and saying that uh, that needs to be upgraded in Ready for Eden, also Morecambe Station. But we are now hearing uh, that they are looking at the possibility of linking the southern trains with Morecambe, which currently you have to get literally get off the train at Lancaster and get onto another line to go to Morecambe. They are now talking, uh, or there is word afoot, of the possibility of linking that across so that southern trains can go straight through into Morecambe. That would be brilliant, and that strengthens the electrification uh, argument. And there's also talk as well that uh, it would also be able to link across so that eastern trains coming from Bradford, Leeds on the Benton line would be able to go straight into Morecambe as well, again, strengthening. So we're, we're getting an awful lot of positive feedback from this. Um, and uh, it's starting to look a little bit 
um, as if we're still waiting for Kanji to come back. It will be Philippa that will be answering, but she has uh, it's it you know the fact that it's it's been delayed and it's taking longer and longer to come. The fact that there are now other groups. Um, one I'm not sure of the name, but I think it's Forward Rail um, is a, a large group, and they have moved away from the idea of a battery and they support the electrification. Several other groups do as well. Uh, the momentum is moving very much in our way. The the only thing I would um, uh, ask or suggest at this time is that the, the, the reason we have revisited the initial uh, project was we had a meeting with the uh, Mark Davis and the city council um, with regard to uh, money from HS2 to see wh whether we could apply for that. Mike Cliff was there. Um, council, uh, Mark Davis, suggested that this might be a project which we could initiate because we said that city should be putting pressure on county uh, to, 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 you know, to get this moving. Um, we've done it. Things are moving. Um, uh, James has written to Mark Davis saying, right, we've, um, we've done this. Um, you know, isn't it time now that you extract them, digit them, as it were? Um, and we've heard a deathly silence from there. And, and I think, you know, we should be pressing them now for them to wade in and, and be talking to or, or, or making, you know, noises to county that and, and adding to the other noises that are already there to make them into a large, you know, such a large noise that they can't be ignored. But that's that's basically it. I think that's that's really if anybody wants to ask a quick question, you know, I think we, we might just have a couple of minutes, but you know, that more or less sums it up. And it's yeah. it's looking like it might happen. Fingers yeah. crossed. Okay, David, thank you for that excellent report and thank you for all the work you've been doing. So does anybody get any quick questions? Doesn't matter if you don't, but I don't think there are. Okay, I'll assume there are no questions. We will be doing this on a different topic each month. Um, and so we'll just roll the topics to sort of try and give you a bit better flavour of all the things we've been up to. So what we're now going to do is move on to tonight's speaker. Now, we're really fortunate tonight because we've managed to obtain the services of Professor Julia Gillen. Um, now, Julia has got a really interesting topic that she's going to talk to us about. And her topic is entitled Picture Postcards of the Victorian Era in Lancaster and Morecambe. So people, I'm sure, will have questions. But if I could ask you to hold your questions until the end, um, and then I'll take you one by one. Don't worry, we'll take all the questions before we finish tonight. So, Julia, if you'd like to proceed. Thank you very much. Thank you for my, for that welcome. Um, I'll just, um, I'm not so used to um, uh, Zoom as I am to Teams, so I'll have to see whether, uh, can you see my screen? Does it look like a slideshow? Yeah, you're fine, Julia. Go ahead. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So I'm actually, I'm not going back to the Victorian era. I'm going to the Edwardian era in uh, Lancaster and Morecambe. Um, and uh, as I say, thank you very much for welcoming me here. I'm from the Lancaster Literacy Research Centre and the Department of Linguistics and English Language. And so um, what I'm going to do is, uh, first of all, introduce it, talk a little bit about the history of the postcard. I'm going to talk about comparisons with social media, which is one of the reasons why I find um, the Edwardian postcard so fascinating. I'll show you some postcards um, in, from and about Lancaster and Morecambe Bay in the area and then finish off really with how you can get involved before, as James just said, um, going to uh, any questions and answers. So introduction to the project then is um, that it's been a project I've been working on for many years um, in between really other projects here at, um, here at Lancaster and uh, the the type of postcard that I think everybody here will be familiar with is the holiday postcard. And 
one of my objectives really is to show you that this was a, a small element kind of in the history of the postcards. And indeed in Edwardian times, it wasn't the most prominent um, element. However, this is an example that is. So um, an extract from this card, we're still having a good time. I've all been Tahitian this afternoon and the children, big and little, have been waddling. So that's the kind of card that might be familiar to those of you who were sending and receiving cards in perhaps the late 20th century, perhaps even into this century. But it's a very different thing in, um, in the Edwardian era, as I'll show. So the main collection, my main collection, because I've developed others now, is um, 3,000 cards written and posted between 1901 and 1910 in Great Britain and Ireland. I started collecting in 2008, originally with Nigel Hall, Manchester Metropolitan University. They've all been transcribed and analysed. Um, and then also, I've looked for them all um, in the censuses to try and find information about the senders, um, the, the addressees, obviously, usually. But sometimes, of course, if people write Dear Mum and sign it David or something like that, you can work out who the sender was as well. And um, this whole collection is accessible through Lancaster Digital Collections at Lancaster University Library. So any of you can access the collection. And I think I'll take the risk, even though, as I say, I'm less proficient on Zoom than on some platforms of uh, seeing, seeing what happens if we click onto it. Perhaps it will go through to another screen. Yeah, perhaps I won't do that. <laughs> Sorry about that. But um, all you have to, oops, there it goes. Right, that's good. OK, so here we have, I hope you can see, Lancaster Digital Collections, which has been going for some years and has a number of open access collections. And this includes the Edwardian postcard collection that you can see just there. And there's others that those of you who are interested in um, uh, local history or, or various topics might find interesting. So all the cards I'm talking about are available there. So back to here then. So why Edwardian postcards? Well, I mean, I expect that all of you know that King Edward VII was the son of Queen Victoria. And it's actually kind of, um, it's, it's that his reign essentially coincides with the golden age of the picture postcard. Uh, it was a time when they didn't have colour photography, but nonetheless, as you can see from this example, they could, um, you know, they could make very attractive cards. So here's one, again, another one sent to a visitor to Hesham. It's a very pretty place and we sleep in the room marked X overlooking the sea. Hope you're all well. Not having heard, thought you might have been ill. And this gives us one clue to why the postcard was different in the era. Because normally, if you were sending a holiday postcard, as I say, in perhaps our youth, um, you wouldn't expect to reply. And this person is puzzled that they haven't had a postcard while they've been on holiday. And that's because they were sent so rapidly. They moved so fast here and there that you did receive them when you were away from home, as well as send them. Another important affordance, of course, that we can take for granted is that you can, um, you know, do something to annotate the front. And we'll see a lot more interesting examples of that. So the history of the postcard, it was actually invented in 1869 in Austria and immediately taken up um, by Britain, many other countries and they were incredibly popular. And this is despite the fact that the original postcards look very boring. You know, this is this is what one side and then the other side um, is, is the message. So why were they so appealing? Well, the answer is that um, they were immediately perceived to be a very attractive alternative to the letter. You went to school, you were told how to write letters. There were etiquette books about writing letters. They were relatively formal, relatively long, if you had a postcard, even one as simple as this, you obviously couldn't write a great length on it. So it gave you kind of a respectable alternative, a way in which you could send a short message. In 1894, we have the, another really important innovation. The other side still had to be used in its entirety for the address. This is strictly regulated by the post office. But on this side, you could have a combination of a picture and an image sorry, a picture and a message. So you can see that the bottom left one has obviously taken the opportunity to uh, write a lot really and included a, a long message there. The one on the right says, dear sister, I have left O, that's for Oxford, and am now in Reading Station, left, love David. And from other cards in the collection, we know that this is David Evans writing to his sister, Mary Evans. David had gone to Oxford to study to become a Methodist minister 
And uh, while there, he sent his uh, sister many, many uh, postcards of, of Oxford. And he also wrote, which is an, another reason for it being seen as perhaps something fairly contemporary, he would send when he was in stations or on trains. You could buy cards, you could post cards, you could send cards when you were on trains. So just a little bit of background then to the age, why the Edwardian age was such a dynamic kind of fast moving age. And this is another reason why it kind of really, really attracts me. Uh, it, it, sometimes people think of it as a, as a kind of quiet time, a prelude to the First World War. But I think if you've ever delved into the area, you'll see it as a time of great change. And so some of the changes that in, affected the uh, golden age of the, the postcard were the following. So the growth of the middle classes, increased leisure time, increased chip, cheap and efficient travel. So in 1909, in fact, the railway um, network was at its zenith, more um, miles of track than at any other time. Increased women's rights and the most extraordinarily efficient postal services. Uh, David was just talking to me about that when we, we met just before this. So um, you could get up to 10 deliveries a day in London. Um, somewhere like Lancaster, there might be six deliveries a day. And we can see then some of this excitement coming out in the cards. So this one's sent from Blackpool. I'm writing this on the sands, so I think almost captures the excitement. We had a essentially virtually universally literate um, population with the Elementary Education Acts pulling through so that far more uh, people from poorer um, districts and families were literate than had ever been possible before. As I've mentioned, they didn't have cheap uh, colour photography, but they did have um, various means of applying colour to cards. The one on the left would have been very expensive in its day to obtain, and um, indeed was expensive to obtain now. But you can see kind of the range of what was possible in terms of kind of colour and finesse of design. And a very important thing, because it's something that actually hastened the demise of the era during the First World War, was the cheapness of paper products. So it became very po very possible for uh, many manufacturers to uh, produce postcards very cheaply. So the people at the time, I'm quite clear from um, all the reading and the internal evidence from the cards and external evidence, were very cognizant of it at being a time of change. So I particularly love this cartoon from Punch. So in the um, top one, you can see, because it's about technologies and how they fail, as well as how they're changing. So the top one, we can see that the um, there is the car in the uh, in the roadway, but it hasn't been working. So the horse is having to pull it along because it's broken down. 1910, we've got the <clears> horse has been relegated to the field. The car's working, but it's being used to pull the aeroplane that isn't working. So the real absolute kind of thing that kicked the golden age of the postcards off was the divided back pictorial UK postcards. So the format that we became useful, we became used to. So you've seen that the original postcards, the whole of one side had to be used for an address, but we've now got half of that side for the address. So the possibility to use the other half for the message. And because it's uh, Valentine's Day, I thought I'd bring you this one. Uh, so it seems sort of quite romantic. It's sent to Miss M. Kitching, Newstead Colliery Knots. I don't suppose I need to read it out, but um, how can I resist? Valentine Day comes once a year. It makes me think of you, my dear. The rose is red, the violet's blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you. And so are they that send you this. And when we meet, we'll have a kiss. Now, the sender of this card could have sent a Valentine's card, a Valentine kind of themed card. There were many of these available. Um, he could have sent a picture of flowers or a kind of a, uh, any kind. There were so many different uh, kind of images available. So I'm a bit surprised when I turned over the card um, to see that this was the image, uh, Beaver Castle, Nottingham. So, uh, you know, it was quite surprised that it didn't choose a Valentine themed card or flowers or something. But anyway, hopefully Miss M. Kitching um, thought well of it and certainly it survived to this day. So, um, so perhaps she did. Uh, another one, a little bit sadder about um, about Valentine's, really, did not have any Valentine's um, in that. And this is one who I've been able to trace in the uh, census. So this is Gertrude Rylott, who actually spent the decade of 1901 to 1911 
mostly moving in different, living in different places. She was the daughter of a house decorator, but lived in various places, including um, Doncaster. But by 1911, was back living with her parents in Kingston upon Thames and working in a dressmaker's shop. So, um, so, well, one mustn't make any assumptions. Perhaps she was very happy in doing so. But anyway, we can trace her through the various censuses um, and the postcards as moving around, but then going back to live with her, her parents. So a bit then about comparisons with social media, which is one of the reasons why I started um, working with the cards. Um, I'm a researcher in literacy studies, which means everyday uses of, um, of, of literacy, and that includes has included for me um, social media. Uh, so I'm, I've just got kind of six topics to go through very briefly here. Memes and themes, efficiency, popularity, opportunities for creativity, informality, or is it vulgarity, and concerns over security and privacy. And we can see in this card on the right as well that um, there's a, you know, that there's a link here with another new fashionable um, technology, the telephone. So memes and themes. In fact, some of the memes that we've become um, familiar with, with the internet, um, were present with the picture postcards. So things like cute cats um, or, uh, you know, cute dogs and babies and so forth. So the, the one on the left um, was from a collect, was from quite a collection sent to Annie Parish. So in my book, which I'll um, plug later, um, naturally enough, then um, I've written about the cards that went to Annie Parish. And Annie Parish spent the whole of her life as an, uh, a rural farm worker in Lincolnshire. Um, and yet her card collection shows that she was absolutely up with the latest fashions and themes of picture postcards. She also used picture postcards to find out about the big cities that she, as far as we know, never actually traveled to, like Dublin and London and so forth. The one on the right um, is a little sad, really, because it's um, it's to a, to a little girl who is staying with her grandparents on the Isle of Wight. Um, unfortunately, her mother died um, while she was still very young, so never did pick her up. Um, the father, who was a railway guard, uh, presumably couldn't uh, look after the little child by himself and in fact then moved in to uh, live with his widowed mother so we can imagine that he had caring responsibilities and the little girl um, Elsie uh, continued to live with her grandparents grandparents a jobbing gardener called Clement Reed and his wife Mary on the Isle of on the Isle of Wight to where this card was sent a very popular um, theme from the in the Edwardian era was actresses so particularly in 1904 to 5. And at this time, then actresses such as uh, Miss Edna May, uh, the Dare sisters and many others actually earned quite a proportion of their income through their picture postcard contracts. So perhaps every six weeks they'd spend a few days, maybe a week in a studio and get paid a lot of money in order to um, have these postcards produced. So that must have been kind of quite a good way of um, augmenting their income at the time. And it made them into you know, key celebrities at the time. But everything, fashions change. And um, uh, actually Peter, Peter Gilder, Gilderdale in New Zealand was one of those who really kind of showed me how these, uh, to look at these time-wise and how fashions changed. And um, if we were sitting in the same room together, I'd, uh, but I, I won't because it will cause too much uh, disruption, I'd ask you to guess um, what fashion kind of followed the, the fashion for actresses. But it was actually rough scenes. So um, one year, or a bit more than a year, everyone was sending each other uh, postcards of actresses. And then a year or so later, they're vying to send um, images of rough scenes, which, as you'll see, have had a lot of artistic license, what we now probably refer to as Photoshop on them, uh, to make them look more and more spectacular. So, you know, it's just interesting to see that these fashions and so forth happened at the time, these memes and so forth. Some of them, like celebrity, we... we we kind of uh, recognise celebrity actresses. I don't recall kind of hearing about the craze for sharing rough seas on TikTok, but I'm sure it'll be a long. Selfies, they could occur too, because one thing that would happen would, was local photographers, as well as the big companies, would get into uh, producing postcards. So you might receive a knock on your door, for example, with a, by a local photographer offering to take your photo um, and then kind of a, 
supply you with, I don't know, 100 selfie selfie postcards or whatever. So that was an, another uh, thing that happened in the day that reminds me of today's um, social media and practices. So speed and cheapness. So as I've said, depending on the area, then the number of deliveries would, would vary. But your first delivery might be at 6 a.m. Your last delivery might be as late as 10 p.m. And an important thing to note is that if you send a postcard, then you could put a half penny stamp on it. So at the time, the stamp for a letter was a penny. So this made postcards cheaper. And we can see from some of the texts on the postcards kind of internal evidence of how far, how quickly they would they would come. So an extract from this one, I did not get home last night until after 10 o'clock. I had three punctures in back tire, but mended them myself. This is, of course, a bicycle, your loving friend, JS. And then very sorry, won't be down today, very wet. So uh, we kind of get the feeling for the, the, the speed of the, um, the, uh, the communications with this one. So enormously popular. And uh, uh, Nigel and I actually read the Postmaster General's reports and calculated that the total number of postcards posted during the Edwardian era was about 6 billion. Uh, the Postmaster General was a member of the cabinet and a very um, important um, figure. So we've, we can find, we can be absolutely certain from, the sense, from looking in the censuses, as well as other kinds of evidence, that they were used by rich and poor women and men. So that obviously there was an underclass in the Edwardian era, a substantial underclass that were probably homeless much of the time, um, particularly at the kind of beginnings and ends of the life, and that uh, weren't able to uh, have homes and uh, share in postcard writing. But beyond that, you can go to the, the very kind of top of society, um, including the king, um, or um, one of the cards in the collection is sent um, to Lord George's daughter. Um, and one of the cards in the collection, not dissimilar, was sent to the daughter of a tin miner in Cornwall. So this one on the right of the um, Manchester Cathedral was owned by um, the daughter of a tin miner in Cornwall with the comment on it, hope you like this for, the, for your collection, sh showing that even in those circumstances, she was able to collect postcards. The illustration on the left is from a periodical, and I rather like it because it shows you fashionable ladies in the park. So they're um, choosing cards from the collection offered by the, by the man. Uh, they're writing them at bottom left and then able to post them onto, onto the um, box in his back. And this is just one illustration of the many possible places in which you could um, post cards. So, Having kind of um, shown you some similarities or comparisons with, uh, with uh, today's media, then uh, a little bit now about um, Edwardian postcards in, from and about Lancaster and the Morecambe Bay area. So this card then, Hesham again, um, but it's actually, it's not sent from Hesham and it's not sent to Hesham. And it is just an example that I see a lot in the collection that wherever you were, you could actually buy cards relating to a huge range of topics. So if you wanted, you could buy cute cats, cute dogs, cute babies. You could buy um, illustrations from all over the country, um, all sorts of topics. And these have been able to find um, both of them actually in the census. So these are teacher friends living in the Midlands and they're, um, you know, they're discussing things that are, um, you know, they're discussing things about going back to school then because they're both teachers. But nonetheless, it's just interesting that uh, the card was thought interesting, perhaps to add to a collection, even though it was sent and received uh, nowhere near Isham or Morecambe. Uh, this one from Furness Abbey. So it is um, obviously off Furness Abbey to Workington. Uh, and Ivor Godney Jones was a 16 year old articled solicitor's clerk. He was in actually a very musical family, um, found out quite a lot about him, the son of a solicitor and a head teacher. And one of the things that's interesting here is another thing that I find in many of the, many of the uh, cars, I'll write you a letter very soon. And very many, a very high proportion of the cards mention writing a letter, receiving a letter, they promise letters. We've actually counted them all, looked at the mentions of letters and what people were doing with them. And what it seems plain is that in the Edwardian era, if you had somebody that you were corresponding to frequently, 
you would, I mean, not precisely alternate, but you would use both letters and postcards. So you might send a card partly to apologize that it's just a quick communication, it's not a full letter. But of course the card was also a gift. So, so you know, you might choose to send it because it added to the recipient's collection or just because you thought they might find it pleasant. So it was a con Edwardians were in a constant chain of communications. You know, people talk about uh, people nowadays being on their phone all the time. Well, the Edwardians were constantly communicating with one another. And it was through um, postcards and letters. So one here from Morecambe um, to Barnsley, um, and it's from parents to their daughter. Uh, we, uh, this is um, this. Yeah, so the father was an engine man, we think, and the eldest daughter, a sewing machinist quilt maker in the census. Right. Um, here's one um, sent to, as you see, Miss M. Southworth at 32 Williamson Road in Lancaster. And uh, this card is not much, but it will help to fill up some, some space or other. No more at present. So it's quite possible that Miss Maggie Southworth, who was 15 when she uh, received this, she may well have been collecting cards. Now you see that it's in a it's in a P, and it could be, for example, that um, she was collecting cards from A to Z. It was obviously very much to the advantage of postcard publishers to create sets like this that people might want to collect, or perhaps she was collecting on the basis of actresses. Um, so um, this this uh, P card is of um, an, the actress Nancy Price. Um, who was very well known as an actress, but also as a celebrity. And I find her particularly interesting because she was also an author at the time. So one of her books that I obtained and read quite, easy, quite easily was called The Gull's Way. And it was about her adventures learning to sail in East Anglia. So she was quite a kind of multifaceted uh, person, uh, as well as being kind of an actress who, as I've said, made some of her livings on postcards. And the reference is to... Um, you know, I, I can't be sure, but it's possible that it was sent from her brother, John, who was a joiner's apprentice. And I'm perhaps going a bit too far there, but um, it seems to me it's got a little bit of kind of sibling teasing in it, the whole card. But obviously, I can't be certain in that case. Sometimes, you see, it's not just the evidence of, the, of a single card that makes you certain that somebody is who you think they are. If you've got several cards um, to or from the same person, and maybe they've signed themselves differently in different cards and you can match up the handwriting. You can sometimes become certain from the evidence of more than one card who the sender is. But in this case, I, I, I can't. It's speculation. But at least we know that um, Maggie Southworth was 15 and living at that card, at the, living at that address at the time. So, um, yes, to uh, Miss Kenningham in Bradford, dear aunt, received your PPC very pretty. So the comment on the card itself. So it obviously suggests that the that the card was sent um, was an exchange of gifts, if you like. So between Miss Kenningham and her aunt, they're exchanging cards that they consider to be attractive and aesthetically pleasant. And there are many references to the quality of the card. So this other, another one to Miss Manchester. So here's an example. Miss Manchester is staying in Blackpool and she's receiving cards, um, you know, as well as sending them. And here's a reference to these PC are excellent. So this is probably, you know, there was a series of cards of this nature, Blackpool and uh, Morecambe and so forth. So they're, they're talking about the quality of the cards as well. And obviously paying attention to the fact that they're collected. And it's because cards were collected that they have come down to us today, really. People who collected them generally put them in albums. And then um, in later times, um, eventually, cards have generally been, been taken out of albums and sold by, for example, postcard dealers or in various places. But I generally buy them not in albums, um, but they must have been in albums a long time, I feel, almost certainly, for them to get for them still to persist at this day and be among the proportion of the six billion that have come down to us. So why? Lots of reasons then. So um, this then to, uh, uh, I should not be able to come up tomorrow, Friday. I can't get a day off for a fortnight yet. I suppose the social will be coming off, but then I don't care much about it. I'm not in such good form for dancing at present. Got a bad cold. Hope you're all well. Yours, Ted. 
So we're a bit of a complaint here. Um, this is to Miss El Elizabeth Anne, generally known as Anne, um, living and working in the household of Percy Coates, um, a Church of England clergy clergyman with six children. So um, Anne, um, you know, and Ted are obviously friends who um, are sometimes at least hoping to dance with one another. Yep, this one. So I was not able to find Miss Elliot um, in the census because, of course, the census is taken every 10 years. Then people aren't necessarily moving at leaving at the same address at the beginning or the end of the era. But um, I did think I'd show you this one because I rather like the uh, the joke about the, um, woke, you know, woke back for wash day, would run up and see you. But then a kind of a jokey reference to the image on the card. How would the man on the back do, Amy? This one is actually one of my, um, uh, it's, it's actually, well, it's, it's a card I really, really like. Um, and in fact, um, I was once phoned up by somebody who started uh, their call um, slightly, about the only negative kind of beginning to a phone call about the postcard uh, project that I've ever had, because they started off by saying, um, uh, what are you doing spending taxpayers' money on um, on, on postcards? And I'm, I need, I need access to your cards. Um, it's not right that uh, the taxpayers have paid for them unless you're sharing access. Well, anyway, I was able to sort of pull myself from getting slightly surprised at this and uh, assure the caller that no taxpayers' money went into buying any of the cards at all. They were all paid for by myself or Nigel or donated to us. So um, no taxpayers' money had gone into the collection. And that then I kind of thought to... Um, uh, say, you know, what what is it that you want anyway? You know, what do you want some cards for? So they said, oh, I want to see um, your cards of Morecambe. So I thought, well, yes, I can certainly share some cards of Morecambe. And obviously the caller won't know how many cards of Morecambe I've got. I don't know myself. So I can share some anyway, share some at scans and, uh, and then uh, get some, um, you know, do that. So I did that. So one of the cards I showed, uh, shared the caller, obviously later on by sharing a scan, was this one. And I'd presumed that it was one of those cards that somebody had 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 commissioned. But the person I spoke to was able to tell me that I was wrong, that they had seen this card before, this card of Morecambe. I mean, obviously, not what I'm trying to say is the same, the same version as sold. You know, the one they'd seen was, um, you know, bought by somebody else, written on with a different message and sent somewhere else. So it's fascinating to me as an example that even really quite a a sort of ordinary street scene can, um, you know, can can be commercially viable, as it were, to turn into a postcard. But in this case, it's clear that somebody, unfortunately, I'll never know who, JHC, um, has written to Miss Croom, um, trying to persuade her to move to this particular area. So, um, you know, you, you might have read it, but um, I won't kind of read it out exactly. But you can see that they've put the number one the number one and the number two up there. And so um, JHC is explaining about how if Miss Croom moves in, um, how much she'd have to pay and um, that he's talked to the landlady for her. Um, and he's also trying to um, encourage her with the idea that there's beautiful weather and then maybe they'll be able to take the more Morecambe steamers or maybe she will anyway. Um, so we can't know whether um, Miss Croom listened to JHC and uh, took, took the rooms or not. But again, I find it kind of just, well, I think, well, at least this card survived. So it must probably survived in Miss Croom's collection. So uh, maybe that's a, a positive sign. Uh, another one then about the kind of, I, I wanted to show you this one again of the kind of the, 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 the sands at Morecambe, but also it's one of those which gives us evidence again about the speed of the uh, postcards. So dear old George, I shall come back tomorrow unless I wire different. Wire, of course, returns, refers to the telegraph, which was possible at the time, but much more expensive, so relatively little used. I shall be pleased if you can meet me. I shall not have much luggage, etc. cetera. Um, the season is ended. So we've got probably somebody who was employed, I think. Um, Fred was in, probably employed at uh, Morecambe for the season and is um, going back at um, in, in the end of September. Uh, another one. Um, just again, sharing um, kind of speedy relationships. So what time they're going to, what time they're going to return. 
tomorrow about 6 30 and telling telling tales about where they've been um where so of yeah of furnace abbey um it's, it's a very very curious one this one rather strange rather unusual kind of language so we can see different um forms of formality and informality mind you are real good old girly there uh this one was sent then from Grange over Sands to um, to Annie Bailiff, who lived in Burnley, but while she was on holiday in the Isle of Man. So I find that quite quite interesting. Um, and so, in conclusion, really, um, James Douglas um, was a young journalist in 1907, um, just kind of getting going. Uh, he later eventually became. Um, the, an editor of the uh, Daily Express, actually. Um, this image from the National Portrait Gallery is obviously him some years later in 1929, before he became editor of the Daily Express. But I, I think I've just got a, a kind of a, a feeling for his um, perspic perspicuity, is that the right word, um, in 1907 when um, he wrote this. So when the archeologists of the 13th century begin to excavate the ruins of London, they were fastened upon the picture postcards as the best guide to the spirit of the Edwardian era. Like all great inventions, the picture postcard has wrought a silent revolution in our habits. It has secretly delivered us from the toil of letter writing. And he continues on, but I think he's, see, he's, he's done a lot there to kind of understand uh, why postcards are such a good guide to the era, um, why they were, as I've claimed, kind of something of a revolution, um, and uh, yeah, and also the link to lesser writing. So I'll, I'll actually speed over this very, very quickly because you can always find it, uh, out about this and you can write to me as well if you um, want to know anything about that. So besides the, um, besides the uh, Lancaster Digital Collection, there's a the website where you can add your own cards or search for cards um, in various ways. Um, yeah, so that's, for example, you know, you can search cards of Morecambe and so forth. We do have a Facebook page, although it's not very active at the moment. I have some further videos on a YouTube playlist. Um, Tom Jackson's po podcast series, um, he's interviewed me, Postcard from the Past. It's good if you're interested in postcards from other eras. Um, my book is extremely expensive because it's an academic book. So essentially, I don't recommend you try and buy it. Um, you could perhaps try and get it from a library or from Lancaster University Library. Um, it's that's it's not so expensive at the moment as an ebook, but it's currently a hardback and an absolutely horrible price, as I will conveniently forget. In um in about July, it'll come out as a paperback, but still rather expensive. Okay, so I'll stop there, and uh, happily um take any questions. That's lovely, Julia. Thank you ever so much. Um, unfortunately, James has lost his internet and has disappeared. <laughs> and he's trying to get back in desperately. Uh, so in the meantime, I'll, I'll stand in for him. And uh, has anybody got any questions for Julia? And can you put the appropriate hand up and then uh, we'll call you and, and unmute yourself. So uh, who's going to be first in? Amy, I think, please. Hi, thank you, Julia. That was so interesting. Absolutely fascinating. I just wanted to ask, because you were saying there were so many collections, sorry, so many postal collections and deliveries in a day, um, were people able to communicate there and back in the same day or there and back the next day? And have you got evidence of that and kind of how was it used? Yes, I have, Amy. So we've got cards. I've got one that obviously I can't put on screen right at this minute so I'd have to search to find it but I've got I've got one saying things like um one says for example um mum don't buy any meat today our James will come in an hour or two and fetch the peelings and give you the meat and things like that and yes so we have got examples of them going backwards and forwards even within a day uh, another one um that I'm thinking of to um uh Janet Carmichael of Buxton while she was on holiday in um in Lockerbie, um, staying with her father's family, then um, one saying, "Hope to see you this evening, love, love Nessie." So yes, lots of evidence of them, uh, them 
going backwards and forwards uh, within hours. Thank you. Anybody else with a question? I've got a, 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 not so much a question. Oh, David Austin, please, David, you far away. If you can unmute yourself. I noticed quite a few of the postcards had the text written upside down. Was this mm -hmm. a, in an attempt to stop the postman reading what, what was written? I think it is, actually. Yes, I think that's, that's very well observed. Um, there's upside down, there's um, in circles, um, and it's just to make it, I think, that little bit harder for the postman to read. But also, there are some cards where I think that um, perhaps they didn't necessarily want other people in the family to read it when it was on the doorstep. So we've got examples of codes, people using shorthand. Um, quite a common one is mirror writing, so that you had to hold it up to the mirror to be able to read it. So, yes, I, th I think you're right. I think that people made use of the different orientations of writing, uh, partly in order to um, not make it too easy for the postman to uh, to, to read it. Or, as I say, uh, perhaps your parents or daughter or whoever might be the first one to pick it up off the mat. Anybody else there? If I can, can I, I'd like to make an observation. And I hadn't realised um, the the different collections that there were uh that uh so you mentioned the ones the film stars perhaps have a series of mm. theirs and and mm. um can you expand on the on the kind of collections the kind of series that that might have been we are, i presume that some manufacturers could have been smart enough to pick up that uh they could use this as a great advertising campaign yes Yes, indeed. Yes, you're absolutely right, David. I mean, this was such a big business in the era that, first of all, actually, um, the there were companies in Germany which were the most efficient at producing the most attractive cards, the most comprehensive series, you know, or we might call them collections and so forth, things like that. And in fact, um, you know, questions, you know, got evidence of a one MP asking a question in the House, House of Parliament. Why are our British uh, publishers and printers slow to act and, um, you know, get, us, get, get in on the act in comparison with these German firms? And sure enough, it did happen that the um, English publishers and Scottish um, uh, did kind of catch up. And they were so imaginative in the different series. So you might have ones that were topographic, i.e. of certain places, or you might do an alphabet series or birds or, um, you know, almost any theme, because the more imaginative they got, really, if they could chime with the kind of with the mode, with the fashion, as I say, the, the rough seas being one example, cute cats, another, you know, you could get in there and um, kind of sell sell more. Is, is there sort of evidence there that, um, that, that, that people held the collections? I'm, I'm thinking particularly like the cigarette, uh, manufacturers mm. did their cigarette mm. cards and and I know there's lots of collections of those yes. that did, did that apply as well to, to well, postcards? We don't actually know I would say because by and large postcards in the last 20 years or so are rarely bought from albums usually postcard dealers often get them from albums through gutting house clearances mm. and things but then they then they gut the albums and they um, arrange the cards according partly to topic and partly according to value. So they'll look through collections, which are, my, which are the valuable cards? Are there, for is there, for example, a card relating to um, cricket or a, a famous uh, celebrity or, um, or a very good quality card made out of silks? You know, can I kind of put those, am I most likely to make the most money out of um, selling them? Um, and so you're unlikely nowadays, it's not impossible, you can go to the Red Rose um, postcard fair yep. in, uh, Barton, in uh, Barton um, about three times a year, for example, and meet <laughs> postcard collectors for yourself. And you'll see that they might have a few albums, but by and large, they're selling them individually. And so I would say that on the whole, David, um, we don't have access to collections in the same way that you actually still do, as far as I can tell, with cigarette card collections. Mm. Usually, in the case of postcards, the albums are broken up. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay. Is has anybody else? Um, oh, James is back with us now. Is anybody else any questions at all for Julia? David, How, can, I, can I ask one? And yeah, I'm sorry, I went to net went down, so I lost a chunk of your presentation. And I wanted to ask Julia. You started off by talking about the frequency of postal deliveries. Yes. Some ten a day in London and six maybe in Lancaster. So. What 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 is int what I'm interested in is what we do with turnaround time because some of the some of the postcards the messages on it implied that people were writing stuff with an expectation that people would get the message later that day or the following day and never go. So I'd be interested to know just a, a little bit about the turnaround time if that makes sense. Yes, oh, it absolutely does. I mean, it it also ties in with the um with the train network being at its zenith. So by and large, they'd move around by um, by by train um, if they were going any distance. Um, a very high, I can't remember, the, I wish I could, but a high proportion of the um, male population were working in the for the post office, either as a post postman or uh, or within the offices. There are just a few occupations in which it was possible for a woman to work, but not as a delivery person. So if you were anywhere in particular, you would get to know, for example, if you were going to send a card home from, like that one I mentioned about the peelings, if you were going to send a card home from work to your mum, and that was quite locally, you'd know how quickly it would get there. If you were sending a car from Lancaster to London, you'd have a very good sense of uh, how quickly it would get there. You'd most probably think, oh, I'm going to send it off this evening and it will get there tomorrow morning, you know, that kind of thing. And so you would become used to it and know how long it would it would take. OK, David, do you want to keep sharing it because you're doing a sterling job? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was inviting Howard in just now, so he's put his hand up. So Howard's got a question there. <laughs> Hi, uh, that was really interesting, um, and uh, you mentioned social media at the beginning, and I thought um, maybe maybe there are differences with uh, social media interactions, that the postcard might be a more kind of personal way of communicating that conveys something of the person who's sending it and uh, enables the receiver to feel some kind of emotion, you know, in, in that. Yes, I mean that's that is absolutely the biggest difference is the fact that um, social media you can go instantly from say for example you know one person to a thousand people, but it is interesting because at the beginning I kind of assumed that cards would be from one person to another, but I've seen more and more in which I've come to realise that it's not actually just one to one; it could be a, a greater number. So I one of the very first ones I showed was of um. Uh, I've forgotten his first name, Mr. Evans, who um, was studying in Oxford, writing to his sister. And his sister collected a lot of them. That was David. And actually, when David got married, um, he and his wife started writing them together. Um, so, yes, you're totally right. There are crucial differences between um, the postcards and social media. But what's interesting and why I would make the claim in the end that there are similarities is that there was nothing similar between the First World War and the onset of the digital revolution in the 1990s. For the whole of the period in between, it wasn't possible to send a message really fast, really cheaply, that combined a message with a picture. And if you remember, actually, even in the 1990s, when we started text messaging um, and so forth, then um, it was actually very difficult or expensive or maybe even impossible to send a picture. So it, it really is the end of the 20th century that only then does it become possible to send a message so fast that combines uh, an image and a picture. Uh, sorry, I keep saying that image and a message really, um, uh, really, you know, together fast and cheaply. And so it's for that reason that I kind of make the comparison. But you're completely right. There are there are key differences. And one of the biggest is is scale. Thanks. Amy, uh, you've been waiting a little while now. But um, so I wanted to lower the tone, if that's okay, Julia. <laughs> um, so I can remember because uh, living uh, as I did with my family in Br in Blackpool for about the age of eight till twelve, 
and going to the seaside news agents and my mother dis distracting my gaze from the smutty cards uh, of which there were very many. Of course, I didn't understand them then, but um, they looked quite amusing. So I guess my question was, maybe not in this area, but do you have a view of when the kind of saucy or smutty seaside postcards started to come in? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. I mean, certainly we're kind of, probably the 1950s was the heyday of the saucy postcard in, uh, in Blackpool, I suspect. But there were saucy postcards in the Edwardian era. Um, you know, I, I could show you, um, you know, I, I have a couple that are a little vulgar, a little crude. Um, we also can see from the newspapers of the day. So, um, so, you know, people writing into the newspaper and saying it's terrible that these young people are sending postcards. You know, why don't they sit down and write a proper letter? Why aren't they... Um, uh, you know, and some of the postcards are, are really disgusting. And occasionally you get something like um, a prosecution for pornographic postcards, for example, um, or kind of tales of them. You know, France was normally blamed for, um, uh, you know, naughty postcards, as it were, um, which was not necessarily fair, but part of the um, kind of feelings of the time. So, so you're absolutely right. Some of them are some of them, um, I've certainly got some saucy ones. I've got one or two that I would even hesitate to show just because it might kind of offend, you know, our sensibilities now. Um, but I think you're right, though, that I think it was with the when the holiday postcard in the mid 20th century was kind of became the almost the only genre of the postcard that you kind of got that association with the seaside um, smut, if you like. So thanks. That's a really great question, Amy. Thank you. Uh, Diane, uh, you, your hands up. Thank you, thank you, Julia, for that. Yeah, a really interesting uh, talk, which actually has explained a lot of um, <clears throat> material that I've got stuffed in a box somewhere uh, that I've inherited from the family. Um, and I think about my childhood in in the fifties, and my mother was forever giving me. Um, postcards of it they were postcards that I now presume were advertising my mm -hmm. um my my grandfather owned a, a butcher's mm -hmm. shop and they there I think it must have been in that era when <clears throat> when there was an that uh the butchers were trying to encourage people to eat New Zealand beef or, uh, well, no, actually, it was uh, it, it was um, lamb, mm -hmm. and uh, he had must must have, um, in hindsight, I see, uh, ordered all these postcards, um, all of the same picture, uh, mm -hmm. but as an advertising campaign to actually encourage his customers um, to, uh, to 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 think about buying meat from abroad, and they came by. A few of them came my way because uh, my mother insisted that I should actually learn to write write a postcard. <laughs> so, so it's just very, very interesting to know a bit more about the background of the material that I've got at home. Yes, thank you. That's great. Thank you. Yes. So the um, you know the commercial ones don't feature so much in the collection, but were plainly um, hugely important at the time. I mm -hmm. suppose people were less likely to put them in the albums and keep them, but certainly we have got some. Um, it's, it's also interesting to me that that whole kind of idea of advertising, uh, using a postcard, all sorts of people. So um, I don't know if it exactly counts as, as advertising, perhaps that's a little unfair, but uh, I've got examples of clergymen, for example, sending postcards of themselves, um, you know, to, to parishioners, um, so it's, it's not exactly advertising, but certainly a kind of self-publicity that looks slightly odd to, you know, looks slightly odd today. Uh, one of them I, I really kind of have to be very impressed by because it's um, it's a it's a, a, a Church of England uh, a vicar who's commissioned lots of postcards of himself and then sat there on Christmas Eve sending them all out to his parishioners to wish them a happy happy Christmas. So that's not necessarily self-publicity exactly, but it's just in, it just sparked me off. You know, you'll talk about the butchers, um, different reasons why people commissioned them of themselves or their business and kind of sent them out. So thank you very much for that. 
Uh, David and Pam, uh, your hands raised. Yeah. Okay, it's just, just a quick comment. Um, just for a bit of fun, about 12 months ago, we were away on holiday in Aberdeenshire, and we just thought our, our son had recently started going out with his girlfriend, so we just thought we would send them both a postcard, which was obviously several miles apart. But to our amazement, the actual, we were in, Aberdeenshire, which you'd think is out in the wilds, but the actual postcard arrived to Rugby in Birmingham the very next day, which we were quite astonished that they actually arrived so fast. Yes. So it just yes. shows it can still be quick when the Royal Mail decides to really uh, sort of get its act together. <laughs> Indeed, thank you. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions at all on there for anybody? Um, yeah, but, uh, just similar to James, I lost the majority of that talk, unfortunately, due to uh, the gremlin gods. So I will have to catch up with it. But yeah, I'm, I was just settling into uh, watching it with uh, great gusto when uh, all hell let loose with my signal. So uh, I will uh, endeavour to catch up with it as soon as it's put on. So yeah, because I was really looking forward to it. Oh, I've got a few. I've you. got a few myself. <laughs> well, I did you. notice one or two people actually disappeared and then kept, kept <coughs> trying to come back in. Uh, so I think there's been one or two gremlins this evening. So it will be in a few days' time. It will be on the catch up. The whole um, the, the whole presentation and the question and answers will all, all be on the catch up. That'll be great. One thing that crossed my mind. Julia, listening to you and looking at some of the cards there, I suspect, uh, and, and this is because I've got a lot of wartime letters from my uncle to my parents, and um, the, the different modes they, they gave. One was where mm. they had a proper letter, uh, air mail, the proper letter they could seal up, and there's other ones which are very, very brief. And, and looking at how sometimes he spread out his letters uh, and wrote larger and everything else. I suspect that this postcard might have been used a few times to avoid having to write a letter. Oh, yes. 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 I, I think this, that's quite clear. Often people are apologetic. I'm sorry I haven't got time to write a letter. Mm -hmm. But at least at least they're sending a picture, so it's kind of a bit of a gift. But, yeah, yeah you're totally yeah, right. That's absolutely what they were doing, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, um. I'm afraid I'll have to go in a few minutes, David. Okay, well, we'll make this the, the, the last question, if, if that's okay. Um, oh. There she is. Sorry, it's just uh, that light doesn't work with the computer. Sorry, Julie, I just thought that was such an interesting presentation. Thank you so much for that. Um, I just, to be honest, it's not really a question. I just thought I'd, I'd highlight um, a, an anecdotal thing that you might be interested in, because um, it is quite unusual. You've obviously concentrated on Edwardian postcards, and we've discussed with Amy's question all the way up to the 50s. Um, when I was a kid, my, my dad was a marine engineer on it, on oil tankers. So he was out in, you know, in the middle of the ocean um, for three or four months at a time. And I kid you not, postcard was basically the only way we could communicate because this is the 90s. So we didn't have email. I mean, mm. you know, they've only just got email on board the ship the last few years. Mm. The only phone was a satellite phone, mm. which use was basically kept for Christmas, birthdays and emergencies. Um, and so when he went into port, he would send us a postcard from the any port that he had. I've still oh. got them. So even in the 90s, it was still a really important part of communication for a very niche part of society, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's lovely to hear. Yeah, and I did I did recommend Tom Jackson, whose kind of work um, and podcasts kind of span the whole, you know, span all eras of postcards. So, uh, yeah, Absolutely. she might find that interesting. But thank yeah. you, that's lovely. No, thanks again, Julia, that was great. Thank you. Well, that's lovely. You, Julia, everyone. can can we just say a very great thank you? It's been a, a, a lovely presentation, and, and you can see clearly by the number of questions. I'm sure we've got more as well. We could we could go on for quite a while. So that shows the amount of interest that's generated, which is absolutely fantastic. So can we just give you a very big thank you in our, our usual way? And you know, it's been yeah. you know a pleasure to have you here. And uh, let's hope we get you back again before very long. Thanks, Thank so you much. very much.
Thank you, everyone. I've really enjoyed Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Bye-bye. Uh, and can we just call on uh, Pam now, perhaps, to uh, give us a little plug for uh, our, our, next, um, our next meeting? Yeah, certainly. Oh, sorry, just a second. Uh, yeah, so the next meeting we've got is with Bill Shannon, who's from the, uh, I always get the title on Lancashire and Cumberland Antiquarian Society. Um, he's going to have a chat with us about a 17th century map. Um, and the date is the 13th of March. So it's 1845 to 19 uh, for a seven o'clock start again. But it will be our first face to face meeting, of course. Um, so we're going to be down at Rowley Court in Scotforth, which is opposite the boot and shoe, in case any of you don't know, just on the crossroads there. So, yes, if you'd like to join us. If you could make sure you're there for quarter to seven for a seven o'clock start, that would be great. Thank you very much. Uh, if I can just say that, Bill, we have had Bill on before with his uh, Morakambi to Morecambe presentation, which, he, which and I've seen him on other presentations. He's an absolute delight, and all his presentations are fantastic and very well worthwhile watching. So um, I would suggest you get there early to make sure you get a front row seat. <laughs> And uh, on that, um, you know, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, and I hope you come and join us at, at Rowley Court in, in March. And thanks again. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. Thank you. Thanks.